and welcome to Announcing the Game, where professional public address announcers share their expertise and best practices to help make you a better public address announcer. I'm Tom Winicky. I'm the public address announcer for Syracuse University and Men's and Women's Lacrosse for the Atlantic Coast Conference. I am also the NASPA Public Address Announcer of the Year from 2017. I've announced international competition for women's basketball and women's ice hockey. I've also announced Division I football, men's and women's soccer, field hockey, women's volleyball, men's and women's ice hockey, men's and women's basketball, softball, and men's and women's lacrosse. I also announced the New York State Public High School Athletic Association state championships for girls lacrosse and for football. In this episode of Announcing the Game, I'm going to talk to you about announcing women's lacrosse, now mainly at the collegiate level, but much of what I have to say you can apply directly to the high school game. I'll go over topics that we'll break down into phases before getting to the game site, pre-game, in-game, and post-game, and we'll go into some detail in each of those phases. One of my goals as a public address announcer is to show up at the game site and when the supervisor there sees me walk in, they know that they don't have to worry about me anymore. I want them to check me off of their, I need to worry about this person, checklist. Now I will take you through some of those steps for women's lacrosse so they can think the same thing about you. Now. Like any sport that you announce, a working knowledge of the rules is important to you being able to announce this sport as accurately and as timely as possible. Now, when played well, this game moves at 100 miles an hour. There are many times when there are officials' whistles and the game stops, but there will be other times that they'll blow the whistle and the game keeps going, and we'll talk about this later. See, as announcers, we never want to talk over the action. Now, we'll go over these type of situations so that you can be better prepared. Now, typically, you'll have some duties to take care of before you get to the game site, and they'll include, first and foremost, confirming names and hometowns pronunciations. Now, this goes without saying. Public address announcer rule number one, always get the names and hometowns pronounced correctly. Rule number two, never break rule number one. Start by calling the sports representative in the athletic communications department at that university. You find this person in the school's athletics website. Locate their staff directory and then scroll down until you find something like athletics communications. Look through that list until you find a person assigned to, for this example, women's lacrosse. And more often than not, what you will find is the same person assigned to different sports in different seasons, and that's normal but find the person listed for women's lacrosse. Give them a call or shoot them an email explaining that you want to take a few minutes of their valuable time to read through their roster with them so you can make sure you have the hometowns and their names pronounced correctly. And for women's lacrosse, you also have to know who the captains are. And we'll talk about that later too when it gets to pregame introductions. Many times, teams will put rosters with a pronunciation guide typed with it. A lot of times you will find that in a media guide, and sometimes you can find that online. My advice to you of using these is be very careful. I've seen many that just plain weren't accurate. For an example, a name like mine, Winicky, may be pronounced in a pronunciation guide all in lowercase. W-I-N-A-H-K-E-E. -E. Winicky. It doesn't tell you what syllable to emphasize. Even if it's written correctly, with a first syllable in capital letters, capital W-I-N, then dash lowercase, A-H dash K-E-E, -E, Winicky. Even though it's printed correctly, make sure that you always connect with a representative from that school either before the game day itself or early on game day to make sure that you interpret what's printed as how it is actually supposed to be said. Now, some colleges and universities go a step farther and they link an audio file to their roster. A lot of times it will look like an ear. So you click on the ear icon and a window pops up 
and most of the time it's a computer generated voice pronouncing the name correctly and the name is spelled phonetically in front of you with the correct syllable emphasized. I've even seen some that have the actual student athlete reading their own first and last name and their own hometowns. Those are the best. I just wish more teams would do that. Now, there have been times when I've gone down to the field to look for pronunciations because I couldn't connect with someone before game day. And I'll talk to a trainer or maybe an assistant coach, and they may have to pull the student athlete aside because they don't know how to say their home, their last name. They may have a nickname for the student athlete. Well, in talking one-on-one -on -one with the athlete, how do you pronounce your name, please? Pronounce it for me. And I'll try to pronounce it back. And sometimes it takes me a few tries. And you can tell they're used to their name getting mispronounced. And they'll say, oh, that's, that's fine, that's close enough. And I insist, no, it is your name. You deserve to have it pronounced correctly. Could you please say it again? I want to get this right for you. And they understand. And in reality, this only takes another 10 or 15 more seconds. But when you do get it right, and you say the name correctly for them a few times, you can just tell in their body language, in their eyes and in their face, that they appreciate it. And deep down inside, you kind of hope that person scores a goal so you'll get to say the name for them correctly over the public address system. Hometowns are another story. Many times you may just be familiar with all the hometowns on the roster, and that's fine. If not, and there always seems to be one or two that you're just not quite sure of. So there's a couple steps I've found to take to help you get to these pronunciations. Now me, I'm someone, I like to do my homework ahead of time before I ask anyone else for help. So here's some steps I've found. I open up YouTube and type in the name of the hometown I'm looking for, and then I search for video. Many times I'll find a local newscast of a local news reporter about a story in that town. So I have a local person talking about the story in that local town so I know I have it correct. Real estate companies are another one. They will post videos of their real estate listings online and many times they're just a video with background music showing the different rooms and the locations of their real estate listings. But sometimes I'll get the realtor introducing the video. Here we are in such and such a town with these listings. So again, I've got a local person pronouncing the name of that hometown. So I've struck gold and I've got the information before I have to ask anybody for help. If I can't get them the, these ways, then I can go to the person in that athletics communications department, the SID, the sports information director assigned to that sport, and get them to help me with the hometowns. Oftentimes, they'll call me back or send me an audio file of the correct pronunciation of the town. Either way, I've got the information and I know I have it correct. Now let's talk about pre-game announcements, in-game, intermission announcements, post-game announcements that you would make. At the collegiate level, much if not all of this comes from the marketing department. Scripts are prepared for each home game. Now be sure to know who does this in the marketing department for women's lacrosse. So you can contact them ahead of time. They can send you a copy of the script that you can read through it and rehearse it with you before game day. Now I like to do this for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, I get to be familiar ahead of time with what I'm going to have to read live on game day. I've also found that becoming friends with this person who I'll be sitting right next to on game day is important. I'll ask them, do I want it read exactly as it's written? Or will they allow me a little bit of creative license to make some tweaks here or there to make it a little more readable for me or maybe easier to listen to in the crowd while still getting their message across that the media and marketing department wants across with their messages. See, I always want to sound like I'm talking to you or I'm talking with you. I don't want to sound like I'm reading copy from a teleprompter and I'm just reading a sentence, period. So I found there's many apps you can find. I have one that I put on my phone, a free app, a voice recorder app, and I'll read through the scripts that they send me ahead of time. So I want to sound like I'm talking instead of reading. And I find that I get better feedback recording it and listening to the recording 
than listening to me as I'm talking. I get better feedback at when I get a chance to listen and just listen and not try to talk and listen at the same time. Whether this copy works best if it's read and it's exciting or it's a questioning bit of copy, maybe it's a trivia question. I want to put that preparation ahead of time so I do my best job for marketing to make sure that the reads they put the time in to create convey the message that they want created. Now, as I said, they may take the form of promoting an upcoming game. For Syracuse's next home game, we will be back here at the Dome on, and then what the date is. An exciting yet informative way to read it. It might be a trivia contest and you talk like you're questioning something. Who led the Orange in goals last season? And then read the, their, their choices, but it's read differently. So there's different ways to read different things depending on the message that the marketing department wants to get across. When reading sportsmanship copy, I want to come across like I'm inviting them to participate in the act of being good sports and helping us develop sportsmanship for our Syracuse men's and women's lacrosse games. So I'll read the copy to make that emphasis and I might try to make it sound like this. The Atlantic Coast Conference promotes good sportsmanship by student athletes, coaches, and spectators. And I emphasize the last part to say, hey spectators, we're involved in sportsmanship as well. And I continue by saying, we request your cooperation by supporting the participants and officials in a positive manner, as if to say, that's what we're looking for. We want everybody to be positive. It goes on to say, Profane, racist, sexist, or other intimidating actions directed at officials, student athletes, coaches, team representatives, or other spectators will not be tolerated and are grounds for removal from the site of competition. Then I'll finish again by inviting them in to say, come on, let's all work together to be good sports. To say, we greatly appreciate your help in making this event a positive experience for all participants and attendees. You can see some parts are said with a little more authority, yet in a pleasant tone. I don't want to come across like I'm the sportsmanship police. Nobody wants to listen to a message like that. Now let's get a little deeper into your pre preparation. Have you ever heard these statements before? Luck favors the prepared. Luck is the residue of design. Good luck today, but remember, luck has nothing to do with it. And this was my dad's favorite. I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, all of these statements tell you how important it is to be as prepared as possible for any event that we announce. In this case, women's lacrosse. Get the rosters ahead of time. Get the hometowns and names down pat. Make those phone calls. Now, I like to put my rosters together a few weeks before the regular season starts in February. Usually by the end of January, teams have their rosters finalized and posted online, and that's when I go get them. I create rosters for Syracuse University and for all of their home opponents, and then I sort the rosters by the way I will say them. Now, I make that point because when rosters are printed online, usually if you read left to right, it's a number, a name, a position, a height, a weight, a hometown. And that doesn't read very well. Number one, Amy Smith, who will be starting at midfield, is a senior from Baltimore, Maryland. That just doesn't sound right. So what I do is I copy and paste these rosters into a spreadsheet. And then I sort them by the way I will say them. I'll resort it so the player's name is last. I'll make their position be the first thing that I read then it's usually their height, their class, their hometown, their number, and then their name. So it would read differently. It would read, starting at midfield, a five foot three inch sophomore from Buffalo, New York, numbered one, Amy Smith. That just reads better. It sounds better that way. So that extra step of resorting spreadsheets and just putting them in the order that you wanna read them, it takes a little bit more work but in the end, it just sounds better. It sounds more professional on game day.
Now let's talk about your announcer's toolkit. I have a notebook that I bring to every game that has everything I could possibly need for any situation at any sport I would announce. That would include extra pencils, all sharpened, all with good erasers because you're always going to need an eraser. I have one of those little handheld pencil sharpeners in there so when the pencil breaks, I'm still prepared. Different color pens, different color highlighters because if you don't have them, that will be the time you'll need a different color for whatever reason. Throat lozenges, I would go through those things like they were candy. Then I discovered, or actually my wife discovered this lemon echinacea tea. And I've heard of other announcers that I've seen online talk about drinking hot tea or hot liquid as hot as they can handle. And when I thought about it, it makes sense. It keeps things warm and lubricated and you're ready to go. So what I did is I had this little thermos and on it, it has a button and I press the button and the lid opens. I can take a quick drink and then close it and get it out of the way. I never need two hands to open and close a water bottle. I can just operate this with one hand and my other hand is still free to take whatever notes I may need to do at that instant. A roll of scotch tape. You're in a press box. It's a hot day. The windows are open and papers are blowing all over. You need your copy taped right in front of you or your rosters taped down so they don't blow away. You'll always need that roll of tape. Extra batteries. I'll carry double A's and nine volts usually. I'm lucky, the arenas that I work in all the time have their own microphones and sound systems. I don't have to bring anything with me. But there have been times when a wireless mic has gone dead in the middle of the game. And instead of scrambling around looking for someone who has batteries, I can just open up my little container, pop a new battery in and not miss a beat. And guess what? The people there in charge, they notice. They notice that you are now prepared for any situation. They can check you off their, I need to worry about this person checklist when they see you walk in the arena. One other thing I'll carry is a copy of my public address announcer's resume. Especially when I announce conference tournament games working at the college level, I like to meet those college representatives and introduce themselves myself to them and say I'm very interested in announcing more conference tournament championship type events for you. Here's my information, my accomplishments, any awards, all my timeline of announcing different sports is there. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they call me back, sometimes they don't. But it's a way for me to get my name out there. Because I figure every game I announce is like an audition. You never know who's listening. So here's the notebook that I've referred to a couple times that has all my supplies in it on one side the orange pouch has all my pencils and erasers. And on this side has all my forms for all the games that I'll be announcing. When I open this up to Syracuse women's lacrosse, it's set to open up directly to the next game I'll be announcing. And I have the visitors roster on the left and Syracuse's roster on the right with players listed numerically because that's the rule and identified who the captains are and I have them printed in the order that I'm going to say it. So in this instance, their goalie is number one and it'll be in goal today, a five foot four inch sophomore from Buffalo, New York, number one, Orally Hempstead. And that's how I'll read it. And it comes down to the bottom where I read the coaches. The head coach in her fifth season, Kim Bartholomew. And you can see how I have it printed out phonetically so I know how to read them. Now that notebook I referred to, I put all my rosters in for that particular season. Now since I announce more than one team in a particular season, it helps to keep everything all in one place. Those rosters are all placed in order in this notebook and paper clipped to the next game. So as you saw earlier, when I opened up my notebook to the section for Syracuse Women's Lacrosse, it opened up right to the game that I have that day with the visitors roster on the left, because I'll read them first, and Syracuse's roster on the right, because I'll read them second. Now, as I talked to earlier, contact that sports information director, that person in athletics communications to go over pronunciations of names and hometowns. Because what's happened is COVID has forced many of these schools not to send these type of people to their road games. So that's why co contacting them ahead of time is invaluable. Now my suggestion, 
get there early enough not to disrupt any pregame routines. I like to get there at least an hour and a half ahead of time. So if I do need to talk to a trainer or an assistant coach, it's before they get into their pregame mode, into running their pregame warmups and such. I owe that to the, our visiting teams when they come in. Now, once I do get their correct pronunciations and I have them down correctly, I always end by asking either the sports information director or if it's an assistant coach or a trainer that if they do hear me mispronounce a name to please, please either radio up to me if I'm in the press box or come right over to me if I'm at field level and please correct me because I want to make sure that I get it correct for their student athletes. Remember rule number one and rule number two. I also take advantage of the fact that teams will post their current statistics on that team's website. So before a particular game, I will go in and look up individual goal scoring statistics for each team and set up a sheet that I can use to announce not only who scored, but how many they have in that particular game and how many they have for that season. It lets me say something like this, Syracuse goal, her second of the game and 15th of the season scored by number six, Diane Dunn, with the assist to Penny Phillips. That's Dunn from Phillips. Time of the goal, 12.34. I feel that this just adds a little more professionalism to my calls. It gives the players credit for scoring and for assisting. It also gives the players credit for what they've accomplished over the course of that season to date. It's a little bit of extra work but it's well worth it on game day. Now, I also make a note if there are sisters on the same team or even sisters on opposing teams. I'll go in and circle their names on my statistics sheets on my rosters to remind me to use their first and last names if they factor into any scoring. If one of them is involved in a goal, whether with the goal or with an assist, I'll use their first and last name in the goal announcement. When one scores and the other assists, then I use both their first and last names for both student athletes in my announcement. That's Stephanie Evans from Amy Evans. Time of the goal, 12.43. See, I don't want both girls to get lost in the shuffle of the announcement. I want to give credit to who scored, Stephanie, and who assisted, Amy. These people will need to know, and they will appreciate it. Their coaches will appreciate it. Their parents in the stands will appreciate it. The fans will appreciate it because they may know there's two sisters, but which got which? You're an informer. You're a tour guide. Then when I go to the game and I flip over to my statistics sheet, one side is a blank sheet that I'll use to, to keep track of goals and assists. Syracuse on this side, the visitors on the other side, goal and assist and the common column down the middle is for the time of the goal. So I'll keep track of those. On this side is a sheet that has individual goal scores. So you can see Amy Allen, number one for Syracuse, has two goals on the season so far. So when I announce her next goal, it's her first of the afternoon and third of the season. You've seen that I've circled two sisters, Emily and Stephanie Evans. So I know if either of those two are involved in a goal or an assist, that when I repeat the goal or the assist, it's by their first and last name, not just a last name that I would do when I repeat it for anybody else. And you can see I have their names printed in phonetically, so I know how to say the names as they get announced. Doing this is an example of doing something that no one will ever see you do, that preparation. But the results make your announcing sound more professional. And a note about calling the time of the goal. It's announced as the time remaining in the period. When you look at the scoreboard, what the scoreboard reads is what you say for the time of the goal. Now that's different from a sport like ice hockey, where it's announced by the elapsed time in the period. You have to do some quick subtraction. For lacrosse, it's called by the time left in the period. Now many scoreboard clocks will count down in tenths of a second for the last minute of a period. 
So if a goal is scored at 32.6 seconds, I announce it as being scored at 33 seconds. My thinking is it hasn't gotten to the 32nd second yet. So I always round up in these instances. Now let's talk more about the rules, in this case for women's lacrosse. Like any good sport, the rules in women's lacrosse are always evolving. Now as announcers, we don't have to worry necessarily about when to stop the clock, when to start it, when to reset a shot clock, but we do need to know why it happened. And when I first started announcing women's lacrosse at Syracuse University, the head coach of the time brought me in and asked me to announce what the fall was and to explain what happened. He wanted to educate the fan base about women's lacrosse. Now, at that point, historically in women's lacrosse, on an official's whistle, the game stopped. The athletes had to stop moving. If they needed to be, the officials would reposition the athletes, and it would take them 10, sometimes 15 or 20 seconds to do that every time. That was time built in for me to explain what happened. Now, to learn how to do this, he gave me a DV from an old game with the audio on it so I could hear the officials' whistles. I could take this home and practice and get my timing down so I could learn the signals, learn what to say and how much to say before the game restarted. And I made up a fold-out cheat sheet, which you all saw earlier with all the official signals on it and notes that I might say about explaining each type of foul. And I found all these on publicaddressanouncer.org. And you can find these for women's lacrosse and almost any other sport there at that website. So I would suggest doing that. Now, I also got to know the director of operations at Syracuse for women's lacrosse and an assistant coach that I was able to ask questions of. When I called them in January to go over pronunciations of names and hometowns, I would also ask, are there any new rules this year that I need to know about for women's lacrosse? They were more willing to help me because they saw that I was putting in that extra time to get it right. And during a game, if I wasn't sure what happened, I wouldn't say anything. Remember, less is always more in our profession. And then I would ask afterwards, I'd try to catch the coach or assistant, assistant coach before they left the field after the game. Or more often than not, it was an email if I knew they had a couple days off between games. Or at the next home game, I would try to catch them on the field before they got into their pregame routines. I would also ask officials questions. I would ask them about rules or calls that were made. I saw this call earlier in the first quarter. I didn't see it, I must have missed the signal. Do you remember what that was? What was it? How would you like it explained to the crowd? They saw that I was taking those extra steps because I wanted to get it right. And as a result, I developed relationships with them that they were willing to help me because they knew I was taking those steps to get it right as well without stepping on their part of the game. Now here's the cheat sheet that I've been referring to. I found these images on publicaddressannouncer.org and was able to put them into a two-page folder that I unfold and put in front of me as I'm announcing women's lacrosse games. Each one has the signal for the foul and the name of it, and I've made notes on a couple of them for certain things I would need to say for each foul if I have that opportunity. The games that you announce, for this tutorial, it's women's lacrosse, but any sport that you are the public address announcer for, you have to understand that it's a team activity. It isn't all just you. One thing I like to say when I describe what I do to others is that I am part of the production, but I am not a part of the show. The show belongs to the student athletes. The show belongs to the coaching staff. They are the ones that our fans have spent their hard-earned money to buy a ticket to come to see. They didn't buy a ticket to come to see me. I'm a reporter. I'm a tour guide. I keep them informed as to what's going on in the game when it happens. Now, yes, I will get more excited when Syracuse scores a goal. But when our opponents score, I'll announce their statistics and their lines with respectful enthusiasm. The way I look at it is they're on scholarship too. They practice all year round also. The least I can do is treat them with that bit of respect. Now, as being part of the production, I am dependent on others 
to do my job and others are dependent on me to do theirs. I depend on marketing to get me the scripts and the timing sheets ahead of time so I can rehearse and I know what to say and when to say it. Marketing depends on me to read their copy in the way that they intend it to be read. The university depends on me to deliver this information to their fans on time and professionally. Fans are dependent on me to hear what just happened in a timely and accurate manner. The officials depend on me to do my job without stepping on the game. They expect me to be done with any of my announcements before they are ready to start the game. Now once the starting lineups are turned in, and depending on the sport that could be anywhere from 10 minutes to a half hour before the game starts, I go through with my highlighter on my remade rosters and highlight the starters and then read them out loud in the order I will be announcing them. I just want to go over reading it through in its entirety, saying the hometowns and names is the way I would do it live. I just want to check once more to make sure I can go from line to line and make it sound the way I want to. Now making your voice sound the way you want to, we'll talk about warming up your voice. Now this was never something that I really did for the longest time. I really didn't take it very seriously. I then started reading some books in my local library about voice acting and they all seemed to talk about warming up your voice. And one particular book seemed to catch my attention. It talked about warming up and after I read it, I thought, okay, let me give this a try. Well, it talked about mouth stretches. Okay, that makes sense. I watch athletes stretching before games. Why not me stretch my mouth? So it talked about making exaggerated shapes with your mouth, a giant O, O, or an E, E. And when I do that, I can feel the muscles in my mouth stretch. It only makes sense. I'm not necessarily a division one, two or three collegiate athlete, but I still have muscles I need to warm up, and that's one way. Another way I read, I thought, this is weird. I'm not gonna do this. Oh, okay, I tried it. And it talked about reading copy in a way you would read it normally. Then to read it with a cork in your mouth. And when you read it, enunciate every possible syllable in every line of your copy. This is weird. Okay, let me try it. So I read a piece of copy from a script from a previous game two or three times. Then I read it two or three times with the cork in my mouth. Then I took it out of my mouth and read it again. And didn't it sound clearer? And then I said I get more feedback by listening to myself in a recording. So I recorded myself doing it. And I thought this makes it tremendously clearer. So as goofy as this looks and sound. I know it makes my voice sound better and clearer. So this is something that I add to my pregame routine for every game. Now let's talk about working with officials on game day. As I said before, the rules for women's lacrosse are constantly evolving and they can get confusing if you don't keep up with them. If there's any rules that I'm not completely sure about, I always ask the officials before the game and they appreciate it because they want to get it right and they want me to get it right. For example, there's a new rule for collegiate women's lacrosse that says there will no longer be a redraw. In the past, this was done if something went wrong with the draw. A player did something illegal and they had to reset the draw. And that's what I would say. I would say we will reset the draw and then I will explain why. The sticks must go up and away and the ball must clear the head. The sticks must be parallel to and directly above the center line for it to be a legal draw. Now as my role as a reporter, I felt it was appropriate to announce this so the fans would know what just happened and why. I actually heard from some officials who said that they heard me making those statements to the crowd as they were talking to the two student athletes ready to take the draw. And the official would say to the players, boy, he really knows what he's doing. Oh yeah, I do. Now with this new rule change about not having a redraw, 
With any violation on the draw, the resulting possession now is awarded to the non-offending team. But if the official can't determine who was at fault in the draw, possession is awarded according to alternate possession, which is determined by a pregame coin flip. Now, I felt that this was something important to say, because if I didn't, and there was a violation on the draw, and the ball was awarded to one team or the other, the fans wouldn't know what was going on. So, with the blessing of marketing, who, remember, has these things scripted out for the game, I made an announcement before the opening draw that says, due to a recent rule change in women's lacrosse, there will no longer be a redraw. Possession will now be awarded to the non-offending team. If the official cannot determine who is at fault in the draw, alternate possession will determine possession. That was determined by a pregame coin flip. Syracuse University has won that pregame coin flip and will be awarded possession on the first such instance. You may be involved in some special ceremonies. Senior day is a popular one. Typically the last regular season home game is senior day. Parents come from hundreds of miles away sometimes to watch their senior day game at the school their daughter was recruited to play lacrosse. Now since you've asked for those scripts ahead of time, you now have the senior day script ahead of time with parents' names in it. If you're not sure of parents' names, a mom and dad might have different last names, a grandparent might be there, or siblings. Now's your time to ask marketing, can you help me with the pronunciations of these people's names? So when it comes to the ceremony, you have it correct. Senior day for these parents and families is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We have one chance and one chance only to get this correct. We have to make sure that everybody's name is pronounced correctly. Pre-game introductions, starting lineups. I've come up with a script for introductions that I feel works pretty well. Now it starts off with a welcome to the arena. I want to sound like I'm glad everybody's here. Not only our home fans, but our fans from our guests as well. And it sounds like this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the campus of Syracuse University and the Ernie Davis Legends Field, the home of Syracuse Orange women's lacrosse. Today's ACC matchup, or today's non-conference matchup, features the such and such university and your Syracuse University Orange. Now, when I get to starting lineups, I like to begin with a short description of the visiting team. And if you noticed before this, I always refer to them as our guests. Now, it's not much, but it shows them some respect and adds a little bit of class to the pregame introductions. I'll list their conference affiliation and their overall and conference records. And if they have a national ranking, I'll also announce that as well. And it sounds like this. Now let's get right to our starting lineups. First, for our guests from such and such university representing the such and such conference. The Bobcats come in with a three and one overall record, two and zero in conference. Then before I introduce the players, I'll introduce the head coach by saying, the head coach at such and such university in her 13th year is Amy Smith. And here is Coach Smith's starting lineup. Now in the past, schools would read starting lineups numerically, ending with the goalkeeper and then the starting captains last. At Syracuse, we always broke it down by position. Let's meet the starting attack. And now starting at midfield. Now let's meet the starting defense. In goal today for the orange. And now let's meet the starting captains for the orange. Well, here's where we have to be up on the rules. Because NCAA women's lacrosse, now the rules have changed that the starting lineups are now to be read numerically. The goalkeeper falls wherever they fall numerically. If they're number zero, they're going to be read first. If they're number 99, they'll be last. If they're number 21, they'll be read somewhere in the middle. Captains are introduced where they fall numerically but they're also identified as captains. So I'll read the visitors' starting lineups, and I do that with something I call respectful enthusiasm. I'm not going to read it deadpan or as if I'm blowing them off, 
they practice every day. They go to adjust their schedule so they can practice and they travel. So they deserve the respect by having their names read with some respectful enthusiasm. When I get to Syracuse starters, I will amp it up a bit, but no one will ever accuse me of being a screamer or a yeller. I introduce them just the same way as I introduce the visitors. Starting at midfield, a five foot eight inch senior from Syracuse, New York, number 12, Amy Jones. If they're a captain, I'd say, at midfield, a five foot eight inch senior from Syracuse, New York, number 12, co-captain, Amy Jones. Then I always finish by introducing the associate head coaches, assistant coaches, and I always include the volunteer assistants. They put in just as much or more work as anybody else. Then if the director of lacrosse operations is there on game day, I'll introduce them as well. When introducing the national anthem, our facility, like every others in the country, has handicapped access and handicapped seating. So I want to acknowledge that in my introduction of the national anthem. So what it sounds like is, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we ask that if you are able to please rise and please remove your hats as you face our flag with your right hand over your heart to honor America with the playing of our national anthem. If we happen to have a live singer, the last part changes to say, as we honor America with the singing of our national anthem, performed today by, and then whoever the artist is. Now I've received some nice compliments from our fans who are either in the service or retired from the military about the parts when I ask everyone to take off their hat or place their hand over their heart or to face the flag. And because of who that came from, I take those compliments very seriously. I've also gotten some nice teary compliments from parents who either has a child in a wheelchair or a spouse in a walker or a wheelchair who felt that now those people were invited to be included in the national anthem. And again, because of who that came from, I take that very seriously. I'm pretty proud of them. Now, as I said earlier, I never want to step on the game being played. We're informers, we're reporters, we're tour guides. We tell people what's going on after it happens. We're not play-by-play -play announcers. So once the game starts, my only really game-related announcements are goals, assists, draws, penalties, and possibly a substitution. And I'll talk about that instance in a few minutes. Again, a working knowledge of the rules is important. For women's lacrosse, after a goal is scored, the official must check the stick of the goal scorer to see if it's legal. You see, the players are able to adjust the depth of the pocket on the stick by playing with the strings on the side. And if it's too deep, the stick is an illegal stick. So you as the public address announcer must wait for the official to deem the stick legal or not. When and only when you see the official give the stick back to the player who scored the goal, then you can announce the goal and any assist. If you see the official keep the stick and wave it off, the goal doesn't count. If you announce that goal ahead of time, you'll then have to retract that statement. And it's not only embarrassing, but people wonder, what are you doing? And that person that checked you off there, I don't need to worry about that person checklist, now has to put you back on there. So wait until you see that happen. After the goal is scored, the game is restarted with another draw at midfield. And I always want to announce who's taking the draw for each team. Now, while this happens more in men's lacrosse than women's lacrosse, there are times it happens in the women's game. Once the draw is won or lost, the player taking the draw may actually leave the field and another midfielder or attacker will come on depending on the result of the draw. You'll see them in the roster listed as DGO, or in men's game, it's FOGO, face off, get off, draw, get off. That's normal. So I always want to announce who takes the draw because they're an important part to the game. Because in lacrosse, if you don't win the draw and get possession of the ball, you don't score any goals. And then you aren't going to win any games. So I always want to acknowledge the importance of that person. 
I'll announce who's taking the draw. I'll say, so-and-so for the Bobcats and Smith for the Orange. For the draw! And I'll belt out those last three words for the draw. Not to be screaming and yelling, but to make everybody pay attention. Hey, we're restarting the game. Let's focus back on the field because the draw is happening. Now, earlier I talked about how fast this game can go and how you're expected to announce both goals and assists. A skill that you'll need to develop is to learn to watch the attacking team and see where individual players are on the field. Where do they like to stand? In this game, many plays are started from behind the net. So first, learn who that player is that usually plays behind the net. What's their number? Keep an eye on them all the time. They, most likely, could be a player that passes to a teammate out front for a shot on goal. Then, keep an eye on who's also cutting in front of the net, looking to receive that pass from a player behind the cage. Look to see their number before they make the cut to the goal. Who's standing where? Who looks like they're about ready to cut to the net? Start to anticipate where they're going or who they may pass to. Now, let's say the play starts up on top and not behind the goal. As this player runs at the goal to possibly shoot, who's around them? Who's on either side of them that could get a quick pass for a shot? Look to see not only the player with the ball, but also the player around them that could get the pass. Now, like any sport, the more games you announce doing this, the easier it will become. I find myself calling numbers out loud to myself as passes are made. 22, 12, 22, 18, 35, 41, 22. To somebody sitting next to me, I might sound like I'm losing my mind, and that may very well be the case, but I don't really care. See, this helps me stay on top of the action and helps me ensure that my calls for goals and assists are accurate. Start to learn how each team sets up on offense. Who's usually where? How do they usually pass the ball around? Who usually gets a pass from who? Start to anticipate and learn these things. Now, the numbers on women's lacrosse jerseys are not always very big, so you may have to enlist a second set of eyes to confirm what you saw. Maybe the marketing person sitting right next to you. Maybe you have access to instant replay. There's nothing wrong with getting some more help. You may also watch a while through binoculars as you learn who stands where on the field, especially if you're way up in a press box. Remember, you're doing all of this so you get it right. Penalties in women's lacrosse usually take the form of a yellow card, and more often than not, that lasts for two minutes. The college official will come over to the table and inform the table of the penalty what it was, who served it, and for how long. If you're down in the field, you can hear that. You can then make the appropriate announcement before play resumes. Syracuse yellow card to number 34, Jane Doe. Two minutes for a cross check. That's Doe. Two minutes for a cross check. I always like to repeat it. Time of the penalty, 1450. Then, once the penalty is over, I announce Syracuse yellow card is now released. Now you have to be sure to have one eye on the penalty clock and one eye on the game. You never want to announce the penalty as released before it expires because if you do, if you announce the penalty is released five seconds before it is, the player in the box releases back onto the field and goes off your voice, another yellow card comes out the player serves the remaining five seconds of the initial penalty plus two minutes more. The coaching staff will be very upset with you and they should be. It was your fault that you didn't look up at the score clock, at the penalty clock. So make sure it's better to be a second or two late than a few seconds early. You may be up in a press box that may or may not be aligned with midfield. If that's the case, you'll need to have a way to communicate with the field. More often than not, there's a walkie-talkie system set up that somebody on the field radios up the call. If that doesn't work or that's not in place, you have to know what the signals are. You have to be able to read that. If you can see the signal and it's not called up, you can announce it. If it's not called up, but you see the person in the box, 
you can still call who it is and just say yellow card for two minutes and then announce when it's released. You may end up watching the game through binoculars to, re to read what the official has to say. It's not the most comfortable of ways to do it, but you make sure that it's announced correctly. So a yellow card is two minutes. Those are releasable. That means if a goal is scored during that penalty, the penalized player can come back in the game. They come back to full strength. The penalty is released. A green card is one minute. Those are usually for delay of game situations or a third defensive foul and a clear attempt that I'll talk about earlier. Those are also releasable. A red card is two minutes, but it's non-releasable. Those are for more egregious fouls. That means the team can score repeatedly and that penalized player cannot come back in the game until that two minutes has expired. A fourth yellow card for a team in the same game is another two minute non-releasable penalty. So you're not only keeping track of the penalties, but you're keeping track of how many for each team. When it gets to a fourth, you then announce that it's two minutes, but it's a non-releasable penalty. Also, a second yellow card for the same player in the same game is a two minute penalty, non-releasable, and the player cannot re-enter the game. So they're expelled from the game. So another reason for you to keep track of penalties as well as for goals and assists. On a women's lacrosse field, there's an eight meter arc painted around the front of each goal. Usually it's painted in blue, sometimes it's painted in red, but you could see it, the different markings. Any foul inside the eight meter arc on an offensive player results in a free position shot. Think of a penalty shot. You could tell the call resulted in a free position shot because you'll see the action stop in front of the goal, the attacking player will get ready to shoot, and the rest of the players will spread out along that arc. Now remember earlier when I said I made that cheat sheet that you saw that had the referee signal out for various fouls during the game. If you saw the official make the signal and you know what the signal was that resulted in the free position, you should say what it is before the attacking player picks up the ball to get ready. If the call was shooting space, you'll see the official put one hand in front of the other. That's called when a defender inside the arc stands directly in front of a potential shooter. You can announce that and say, shooting space ruled against the orange, which results in a free position for the Bobcats. and whoever the shooter is. If you can't see the signal or its meaning just slips your mind or you can't quickly find it on that cheat sheet, it's perfectly okay to say, foul ruled against the orange inside the arc, resulting in a free position for the Bobcats and Amy Smith. Remember, less is always more. Now, most of the time, when you hear whistles, the game will stop for a second and it will restart quickly. One time in a game, there'll be whistles, but the game will not stop. This happens on something called a clear attempt. When the defensive team in their defensive end gets possession, they try to clear the field to the offensive attacking end, which is usually the opposite 30 yard line when you play on a football field. So they have a clear attempt. The defenders, in essence, can foul twice before getting penalized. So if the defensive team picks up the ball, now becomes offense and they try to clear, defense aggressively tries to steal the ball. The official will blow the whistle once. The game keeps going. If there's a second foul, they'll blow the whistle a second time. That's two. The game keeps going. But after that second foul, you'll hear the bench and the coaches yell for the defense to back off because if there's a third defensive foul on a clear attempt, that's the green card. That's a one minute penalty. Just something to be aware of with the rules in the game. Now, as I said, the rules have been evolved to make this game faster, more continuous, so it doesn't stop and start as often. Since play restarts immediately after a whistle, oftentimes it's not wise to say what happened because now you're stepping on the game, you're talking, and the game restarts. You now have to kind of pick and choose when you can best 
explain what happened. I said there's an appropriate time for you to make a substitution call. Usually in lacrosse, substitutions happen on the fly. Offensive middies come off, defensive middies come down. It happens instantaneously. It's impractical and practically impossible to try to announce who comes in and out. You can't do it without talking over the game. So it's best not to keep track and not to try to do that. The only time it is appropriate is if there's a substitution for a goalkeeper. Now, if you notice when it happens, you can announce it. If you miss it, you have to wait for the next dead ball. Usually, if you catch it right, the attacking team has possession. They stand out by midfield and they play catch, or they get behind the goal and they just, they're just they killing time for a minute, and you can see the old goaltender come off and the new one come on. At that point, you can say, now in goal for the orange, number one, so-and-so, and you can do it then during play. If you miss it, you have to wait for a whistle and there's a dead ball. The ball goes out of bounds and it takes a second to get the ball back and restart. Now in goal for the orange, number one, so-and-so. You can do it then, you can sneak it in. Another optional announcement I like to make is last minute of play in the period. I like to do this. Now for the last minute of play in the fourth quarter, I change it to say last minute to play in regulation time unless it's a blowout, is a big differential. Then it'll just be last minute of play in the period. If the game does go to overtime, overtime rules in NCAA women's lacrosse say overtime is played in six minute periods and they are sudden victory. First goal wins. If no one scores by the first three minute mark of that first six minute overtime, whistle blows, the game stops. Both teams switch ends, nobody goes to the bench, there's no rest, coaches can't coach. The game starts immediately with another draw at midfield. And this format continues until a goal is scored. So it's always good for you to announce the overtime timing format once regulation time ends and overtime begins. Remember, we're there to inform the fans about what's going on. And this is just another way to do that. Injuries, they always happen. We never say anything if there's an injury. This goes for women's lacrosse or any sport. No music is played. We don't say who the person is. We don't announce we hope they get back in the game. We stay out of it. We stay quiet, music stays off because people on the field need to communicate. Do they need a trainer on the field? Do they need to get a stretcher? Do they need to call for an ambulance in the worst case scenario? We need to stay out of the way so player safety is first and foremost. Our job then is nothing. Especially with collegiate lacrosse seasons beginning in February, weather delays are always possible. Later in the spring, when the weather gets more volatile, lightning and thunder delays can occur. And lightning delays are always 30 minutes after the last seen lightning strike. If there's a lightning strike and it was 25 minutes and there's another one, it's another 30 minute delay. We have to be ready to make those announcements. Once the officials call this delay, and it's the officials who do that, our job is to calmly announce for everyone in the stands to quickly and orderly leave the facility. Individual schools may have designated places for fans to go. Check with your institution to see what their plans are for just such a delay. Have that scripts ready. The school may have these pre-made, but who knows where they are on game day. Ask for a copy of those. Put them in your notebook that you bring to every game. So if those situations arise, you are ready to go. You've prepared yourself and you are ready. They don't have to scramble around looking for those scripts. Remember what I said earlier, we want to be the person that that supervisor sees and checks off there. I need to worry about that person checklist. This is another way to do that. Take that extra step that nobody sees you do 
preparing for every situation. Scoreboards can malfunction. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, you have to be ready. Time is now kept on the, on the field. You should announce that to the crowd. If you have access to that on-field timekeeper, you can make arrangements to make announcements every minute. Inform the teams of the time. Eight minutes left in the period. Seven minutes left in the period. Last minute of play in the period. Announce to the fans what's going on. Let the officials know what's going on. It's just another way to contribute to a smooth running contest, no matter what the circumstances. Now, go back to what I said earlier in this tutorial. We are reporters, we're tour guides. Our job is to inform fans of what happens right after the fact. You've heard me talk about something called respectful enthusiasm when I make my announcements. When I announce anything for the visiting team, I'm not going to deadpan it or downplay it. They are on scholarship too. They practice every day too. They go to classes every day also so they deserve my respectful enthusiasm. Now, that being said, I've never had an event supervisor come to me and say, Tom, come on, we gotta get this crowd pumped up. We gotta get them loud. I've never had that happen. I've been lucky. Rather, I've got compliments on how I was enthusiastic, yet knowledgeable and respectful to both teams. I've even had people tell me that they couldn't tell which team I was rooting for. Now, to me, those are great compliments. My goal is to announce every game like it's a championship event. Both teams deserve my enthusiasm. I can do that without being a screamer and a yeller. And you can too. Now at the end of the game, I always end the game by announcing the final score, unless the goal differential is more than 10. Now I use 10, especially for women's lacrosse because the rules for women's lacrosse say, if during the game the goal differential ever gets to 10 or more, the clock keeps running. After goal, the clock keeps going. After whistle, the clock keeps going. During a penalty, the clock keeps going. If it gets under 10, then the regular stoppage rules apply. So I use that as my guideline. If the final score is more than 10, I won't announce the final, just out of respect. After the final score, I'll thank everybody for coming and for supporting Syracuse University women's lacrosse. Then I'll get to where their next game is. If it's a road game or a multiple game road swing, I'll announce where those games are, what time they are. They can pick them up on a local radio station or if it's a local television network or a national network that's picking up the game. I want our fans to be connected to our team even when they're not at home. So by announcing when their road games are, does that. Then I'll get to their next home game. After that, I'll announce when they can get their tickets and where they can get them. Is there a box office they can get to? Can they order their tickets over the phone? Is there a way to do it online? So we enable them to come back to the game. Finally, I'll give a shout out to the event staff and the security that will be available outside after the game, saying, we want to remind all of you that the event staff here at Ernie Davis Legend Field and the Syracuse Campus Police would ask that you please buckle up and enjoy a safe trip home. And wherever you go, go Orange! I figure this is a nice way to end the event by hoping they all arrive safely at home and promoting one last time about being a Syracuse Orange fan. Well. I hope this tutorial has been well worth your time. I hope you found some things that you can use the next time that you are a public address announcer for collegiate women's lacrosse. And remember what we said first, a lot of this can also apply to the high school game. Feel free to email me with any questions at winicky 59 at gmail.com. That's W-I-N-I-E-C-K-I, -I -E the number 59, at gmail.com. Dot com, and I'll do whatever I can to help you out. Also, please feel free to browse our website, publicaddressannouncer.org, for more information and lots of handy resources. So again, 
I hope this tutorial has both educated and encouraged you to jump into announcing collegiate women's lacrosse. Thanks for watching this edition of Announcing the Game, and I look forward to hearing you on the mic. <laughs>